welcome to Message to Light Workers podcast, an interview series created to share and connect through our healing work and life path. My name is Brie Hernandez, aka Santora Kuma, and I'll be your host for today. I will be sharing each guest's information in the info box. I just ask that if you feel inspired and motivated by these stories, that you please share, like, and subscribe so that this channel may grow infinitely to inspire and motivate other people and light workers around the world. I thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this session. Today we have an awesome guest. Her name is Patty and she's an energy healer. I brought Patty on because she has been a tremendous mentor to me and I thought she'd be super, super great to share her story with all of you. So Patty has a life path in which she has been called to do healing work and she's a born intuitive. Um, in the process of tracking lineage, part of this tracking um, led her to areas of Usui Sensei's uh, birthplace, which is the founder of Reiki. Also, um, she's a native Hawaiian. The discovery of Kahuna lineage comes from the Kahuna Kahu uh, window, the silva on the island of Oahu. Her European roots in Greece and Ireland is still in progress and suggest her ancestry in the area of the healing arts. Patty's passion and calling is to use her calling and intuition as a healer, a teacher, and guide, providing healing support to all of those who are called to her. Her lifelong calling led her to formally study various healing arts and has been practicing since 2012. Through this calling, she's been uh, able to witness phenomenal transformations for herself and others. Her vast and varied life experiences and study has led her to a deep understanding of how stress impacts overall health. It is this personal understanding which drives her to offer this relief through Reiki, along with other healing options. This enables the body to relax, allowing it to heal. Being in a state of peace allows one to tap into tremendous reserve of universal healing energy. Other healing modalities which she has studied and practiced include shamanic practice, sound therapy, crystal work, Akashic record enhancement, um, muneiki, divination card sessions, and life coaching. She has additionally tr uh, additional training with healing animals via animal Reiki and animal communication. In addition, to her healing path, Patty has been called to spread crystal healing by supporting those who are called via her large inventory of crystals and minerals. All of her inventory is regularly cleared and charged and blessed. This inventory also is used in her healing work and is regularly programmed with a wide variety of healing audiobooks. Patty, this is amazing. It sounds like you do a ton of work that you've gone through a ton to even be able to understand what it takes to kind of get to that place, as you said in the bio, a place of peace where someone can actually go through that healing process. How did this all start for you? Can you kind of start from like the beginning? Sure. Like now, like that transformation. <laughs> and thank you, first of all, Bree, for having me on here. Uh, I think as a healer and a teacher, the highest honor is to watch your students grow. And it's kind of like having children and watching them grow and come into their own and become a fantastic teacher and healer themselves. And so again, what a great honor to be with you here today and watch you grow uh, because you're at a place now uh, of tremendous growth from when you first started. Uh, so in the healing work, most people, um, and I say most because it's, it's, there's always uh, different situations for everyone. There's some kind of a necessity of healing that takes place for the individual. And uh, yes, we all want to hear about those phenomenal stories where, uh, oh gosh, she's been through so much or he's been through so much and look at him and look at her today. Uh, but for example, uh, let's take a worm, okay? So I used to have a fear of worms and most people will start laughing when they hear about this, but my fear of worms was so intense that 
I would, if somebody had brought a worm into the car and started driving, I would open the car door and jump out of a moving car because of this intense fear of the worm was so great. Well, where does that come from? If never, ever in my childhood growing up, did that happen? So you have to ask yourself that question that comes from beyond. So what led me to this path was kind of a long twisty road. Uh, I grew up around uh, domestic family violence, a very intense, uh, my mother would get beaten regularly by my father. Uh, and so that brought in all kinds of intense emotions, uh, turmoil lifestyle, uh, just, I should have fallen into the path of getting tangled in drugs and, and, you know, being on, uh, you know, just have a bunch of kids and just never getting out of that cycle. Um, but instead, it was a path really of a loner, uh, kept to myself most of the time, um, really getting the message, but not hearing the message because I was too locked up in the family issue. Uh, so in 2013, um, I was getting a divorce from a very controlling, uh, unstable individual. And amazingly, because of my turmoil upbringing, I was able to maneuver through this event. So one day in 2013, a friend of mine said, why don't you go to this um, life coach, energy worker, light worker, Reiki practitioner, and just see how it goes. So given my adventurous side, I thought, oh, this sounds like fun. We're going to do this. So by then I had uh, really what I thought got over the turmoil of the divorce and I, I felt good, you know, going in to see this healer. So I thought, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be relaxing. It could be like a massage. So I go in there, this wonderful woman, uh, just delightful. You know, her voice was like walking on a cloud almost. And she said, you know, let's just talk about, you know, what you've been going through. And so I talked about it. No tears now, because I thought I was at this great space. And, you know, she put me on the table, really nice decor in the room, soft music. And still thinking this is going to be like a massage. So I lie on there and then she has this, what I know now is a pendulum, but I thought, oh goodness, what is this thing she's going to wave above me, right? This is just a little spooky. And I, I'm laughing to myself because now I do the same thing. And I, I realize now in, in sharing my story that how spooky I must look, but um so I close my eyes and she's doing her, what I thought at the time was spooky. And uh, it was like this surge of energy. And so she stayed over my heart and I felt this building, okay? But it was different. It was not like you watch a movie and cry. That's a, that's a different, or you have some physical induce emotional situation where you can feel your body and you know you're doing a physical cry. Well, all of a sudden, like, like somebody turned on the faucet in my eyes, I started crying. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, this is a weird cry because my physical body is crying, but my emotional body is not crying. And that's all I can really explain about how that felt. It still, till this day, perplexes me because I don't understand that feeling other than that. So she's still doing her thing, you know, doing Reiki and waving her pendulum and laying her hands on me, not really saying anything, but the music's still wonderful and I'm still like crying. So then she does something over my heart and then the faucet turns off. Okay, and then I just stop crying just like that. And I'm going, well, this is really weird because I don't know how I did that. Because under normal circumstance, I'm crying that hard. 
I would be doing that, you know, convulsing thing, right? And there would be this subsiding and then it would take me a few minutes to stop. But in this situation, it was like on and off. And so I'm still laying there going, this is really weird. So the session was done. I felt so refreshed. My eyes didn't feel like that puffy goldfish and I felt great. There was no like residual. I just had this big cry. And so now I want to go to sleep. None of that. So we're talking about what happened. And she said, you know, you're carrying that divorce in your heart and it's really heavy. And so we took some of that out, but she would recommend, you know, a few more sessions because it's not a one and done. I have no idea what she's talking about at the time. Did not know anything about the energy work. So I'm just sitting there nodding, going, okay, because I'm still a little freaked out that she made me cry and then she made it stop and I don't feel the normal feelings that I would feel on a regular cry and feeling fantastic, like I had slept for 12 hours, you know, I'm leaving and I'm driving and it, where she was located in, in Louisville was on the cusp of the countryside. So it was a little bit of a drive to get back home. So as I'm driving down this country road and I'm like, still not knowing what the heck <laughs> happened to me, I hear this voice that says, you need to do this. You need to do Reiki. You need to learn Reiki. I'm like, what? And so I'm like looking at my radio and it's still playing. You know, I'm looking for some kind of a obvious, maybe there was a whistle through the window or something. I didn't really hear that message, okay? Because I know nothing about what just happened. And the voice came in even louder and said, this is what you're supposed to do. It was a male voice and you need to do this. And so then I got really scared and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So then it was like this transformation of source took place and it was, I don't want to say overwhelming. It was not the least bit spooky. I, I want people to understand that this stuff isn't spooky. And it just drove me. It, it was like, I let go of some stuff and now I was in this mode and I was driven to do this work. And I had narrowed it down to a couple of different Reiki practitioners and uh, I chose my teacher. And um, it was like this hunger that I've never known. And I was driven to learn and learn and learn more. And it got to the point where I was comfortable in hearing the message. I was no longer scared of that voice inside. I didn't identify it with being crazy. I was still living life. I was still working my uh, full-time job as a software tester. Um, and the crystal part of the journey, I was actually at uh, a show looking at crystals. And once again, here's that lovely voice of mine. And uh, I'm, I'm having fun. I'm looking at all this shiny stuff and there's like a lot of people and it's great. It's a great atmosphere, high energy. And then I hear that voice. So this is how you spread the healing. Because I had said at that point, I really got into the work. I understood that the benefit of regular meditation and sitting in that quiet space and listening to that inner voice. And I would say to my team, uh, you know, I, I really want to be the best healer and teacher I can be. And this is important. Um, people need to get this. And I don't know how to spread this so people that are ready can understand. And so as I'm holding on to a crystal, I couldn't even tell you which one it was anymore. That's the message I got. This is how you spread the healing work. And so that's how the crystal business started. Did not really know anything about how to start a business, how to do a business. Um, so I thought, um, and I sat with my spiritual team and I said, hey, look, if you guys want me to do this, then you're gonna have to show me out because I have no clue. And so here we are today, um, doing the work, doing the healing work, um, students, clients, um, crystal advocates, and, you know, back in 2013 to now, here we are in nearing the end of 2020, and I am in full force of this business. And so I thank my guidance uh, and the universal message 
of why I'm here and that's how I got here. Beautiful. Now, could you share with, because some of the listeners, you know, we have different levels of people. There's people that are just starting figuring out what this stuff is. And there's some people that are like full fledged, you know, could you explain a little bit about what crystal healing is and then also explain what Reiki healing is and, and like just what that is. So they have an idea. Listeners have an idea of what that is. <clears throat> so, uh, Reiki healing is the universal life force energy. And we speak to that a lot. And it's really hard to describe because you can't see it. As a society, we have conditioned ourselves to the seeing is believing uh, kind of a situation. And seeing is beyond our eyes. So as you know, um, when you're in training with me, we're not using our eyes. And that's by design. That's so that we can feel the feelings of the energy because it's not always big. You know, you don't, not everybody gets that really loud message in your head as you're driving down the street like I had. And <clears throat> I think for most people, because you can't see it, then it's not real. Uh, and because we're so conditioned with, you know, technology so, so super duper, I mean, look at us, we're, we're here now talking to each other and we're sitting in two different places. Um, so we get conditioned to the seeing is believing, which is why we don't feel, okay? So I do wanna to touch a little bit. Now we know we're, we're to some extent kind of shut in from Corona um, and for some people that hasn't been easy and I understand that. Uh, whereas for uh, us, because we're so conditioned to going within, to a certain extent, it's been okay for us. So to explain the Reiki energy, it is energy, it is a frequency, it is all about feeling those subtle changes. And so it is universal energy, which is all around us. And Reiki, in Reiki, we are able to tap into that and become the conduit uh, for that energy. So it's kind of like being the extension cord, plugging into the wall and then administering to the person. Crystal energy, <clears throat> is also a, a type of energy. So if you think of us as um, a frequency, so everything's energy, uh, our bodies, um, the plant on the wall behind you, the wall itself, um, your hair, the lipstick that you put on this morning, that's so beautiful. Um, the color is a frequency. And so I think the best way for me to explain that, um, whether it's a beginner or to an advanced individual, when I did a talk a few years ago, um, trying to get folks to understand frequency and how that kind of crosswalks. Um, death um, is zero frequency, okay? Death is zero frequency. And when I opened the gate, with death, people go, <gasps> okay, because it is that that's how we associate with it. And that's okay. Doing that <gasps> is a frequency. Okay. So if I were to say, give me an uncomplimentary word, Brie, what is an uncomplimentary word to you? Ugly, ugly. So if I said, Brie, you're so ugly. And you feel that, right? But if I said, Brie, you're ugly and smiling at you and just sending you the love, I'm still saying the same word, but that feels so different because the energy and the intent that I have in myself that I'm sending outwards to you, it no longer feels the same, okay? So if death is zero frequency, and we go up the scale a little bit. So then we talk about shame and guilt and depression. That's functioning at our 10 or 20 frequency. So then that we would talk about in Hertz. And I don't want this to be a science show, um, nor can I explain really well uh, from a sciencey standpoint, but to put a number on it, because when we put a number on it, then we can understand as human beings. Uh, quartz, functions at 32,000 plus frequency, okay? Which is why we use it in computers and watches and, and all of that because it's able to hold and retain that information through pressure and heat, okay? Which guess what? As human beings, we can apply pressure and heat, okay? So the common school of thought is, oh my goodness, um, 
if that's the case and I'm feeling depression and anger and shame and guilt, let me just hold on to this quartz. Please don't do that, people, okay? That's taking you, you're still human. That's taking you from such a low frequency and shooting you up to this really high frequency. And sometimes it can intensify that state of mind where you're at. So we always go to the rose quartz, let's say, because that's that loving, slow, just, we're just going to hold on to you and wait till you get a little higher in the frequency and let some of that uncomplimentary go and get to a little higher space. Then we're going to bring in quartz that's really, really high with the rose quartz, let's say, and then bring you higher and higher and higher until you, at least to that neutral space where you can go, okay, you know, um, my boyfriend left me, but I'm okay with that now. You know, it's no longer being internalized as it's my fault. It just is. So that is how I would probably explain the Reiki energy and uh, the crystal energy. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to caveat with is people, when I do shows, they come into the booth space and they'll say immediately, I want a crystal that's going to take care of my headache. Well, there are crystals that specialize in that. However, I always like to talk to people about the underlying cause, because if you and I went into a booth space and we both have headaches, but the reason, the underlying cause of why we have that headache is going to be vastly different and how our bodies work through that headache will be vastly different. So there's exercises that I also go through um, to have people understand that maybe it is tiger eye that you use uh, for this particular headache, but you go to work and um, there's Sally Jo there and she's like really down all the time. And she sees you, Brie, and she's like, oh my gosh, this is the speaking of light that I really need. And she latches on to you. And then all of a sudden you get a headache, right? Not because she wants to give you a headache, but because she's so in need and she recognizes you as a healer, right? So maybe tiger eye is what you don't need, right? And maybe you need uh, some other complementary stone. Um, maybe it's, it's an, an, an anti-inflammatory, like an amber, let's say. So um, the basic terms is we are energy. When we do certain things to ourselves, knowing or unknowingly, that's energy. Um, staying in those uncomplimentary energies to where we get inflammation causes then some illness. And so the Reiki and the crystal energy is all about bringing your energies back to a state where you can start managing. So you're kind of like at a neutral, what you were talking about, neutral state. Correct, neutral state, being in balance, what we, what we call uh, being in balance. Okay. So um, I kind of don't, I'm, I have a list of questions here that, we, that we're going to go through. Okay. And so I'm going to just kind of shoot them off and you can answer them as you, as you feel guided to. Okay. So what event, I think you kind of already answered this, so I'm going to ask you again anyway, what event took place that had the biggest impact on your spiritual journey and what did you learn? Uh, that is going to be, uh, you know, when I went to that Reiki session again, back in, in 2013, um, there have been throughout my career in doing the energy work, such phenomenal experiences. Um, but it was that that started it. The biggest impact, I would say, um, in the energy work uh, was forgiving my father. So we talk about that a lot about forgiveness, not even in the energy work, in the psychological circles and the medical groups, they talk about forgiveness. Um, you know, as a child growing up in domestic violence and experiencing it, um, even in the womb, you know, my father had punched my mother in the stomach when I was, when she was six months pregnant. And so in that energetic moment, I was born into that situation. Um, and so I did hate my father for a long time, uh, which is understandable. You know, he's, I'm watching her beat my mom and, and we're having to run out of the house and hide. And, you know, it, it was very, a, a turmoil upbringing. And yet it allowed me to become um, fantastic support 
uh, to a lot of other folks. But for the longest time, I hated him because I had the thought process that if I hated him, that would keep him somehow in this horrible life sentence because he was such this horrible man and he gave us a horrible life. Uh, but what I was doing was I was hurting myself. Uh, it ended up manifesting in physical ways, the two leaking heart valves that I have, uh, 12 colon polyps, you know, which have since been resolved. Uh, and then I got the call one day um, that my father had a brain tumor and my brother had called me and he said, you know, you, you need to know that this, this isn't looking good. And this was in 2017, I flew out to Hawaii and in flying out there, uh, you know, I was having a session on the plane with myself and my team and I'm saying, you know, I, I, I have to resolve this. And my team didn't really say anything to me, but they were all kind of huddled around me and they were just hugging me. And I didn't at the time understand what that meant. Um, there was a little voice inside of me, which, we now know his ego going, don't you dare let him off the hook. Okay. So I was still having to work at that time. I was able to work remotely and um, my flight got delayed going over to Hawaii and uh, spent a lot of time reflecting in the airport. And I got there a day later. And when I planned to have gotten there a couple of days before, because I wanted to make sure I had time to have this conversation with my dad uh, before he went into surgery. And so my stepmom is telling me, you're not going to make it. My brother's telling me, you're not going to make it. They're going to take him into surgery. And I had to work that next morning. Um, but because I'm on the East Coast and there's a six hour difference in Hawaii, I had this, a little bit of cushion. So I got out uh, of work at noon and I was furiously rushing to the hospital. Everybody's telling me that I'm not gonna make it, that they're gonna take him before surgery. And I walked in the door and he was still there. And the look on his face when he saw me because he nobody told him I was coming, I'm not sure why. And uh, I said, oh good, you're still here. Um, I thought they were gonna take you for surgery. And he looked at me and he said, well, first of all, I'm shocked you're here, but thank you for coming. And they didn't take me to surgery yet because there was an emergency situation at the hospital and that delayed my surgery. And so by now I'm having dialogue with my team and they're like, this is my design. And I'm like, okay, thank you. So I sat there and I held his hand and I looked at him and I said, dad, you know, I have to say this and I want to make sure we clear the air before you go into surgery. And I said, I, I just want you to know that all the years I endured you beating mom, I said, I really hated you. I said, it was an ugly life. We were scared all the time and it wasn't fair to us. And for the first time, Bree, he looked at me and he had tears in his eyes. I never seen this man cry. Okay. It was always the strong, I'm a samurai, you know, he's Japanese and I'm a man. But for the first time, I saw the tears well up in his eyes. He grabbed my hands and he looked at me like first time I saw my dad in this state. And he said, I am sorry. He said, I cannot tell you enough how sorry I am for what I have done. And he said, and that's all I can really say. And you know, he's in tears and I'm in tears. And at that moment, all this medical staff came in and said, Mr. Matsumoto, it's time to go. And I sat there in the room, my, my team still, you know, they're all hugging me. And I'm not sure what really was happening at that point. And he was gone. And I thought, okay, I need to go to the beach. So I went to my favorite spot. Um, and if anybody goes to Ko 
Ko'olina on the island of Oahu. That's the place to go. Uh, and I sat there on the beach, which I want to interject here. The beach is one big crystal, okay? The, the salt water is a crystal, the sand is a crystal, and then you've got the sun clearing and charging simultaneously. I sat on the beach and I just cried. I cried and cried and cried and cried. It was like all these years of abuse, the hate. I saw this huge boulder. I mean, the biggest one that I, I I've, have ever seen literally coming out of my heart, going through my head, coming up through my crown, crown up here for those that are not uh, well versed in that. Hate, it was the hate coming out of my body and going up to the light. And then I sat there and then, you know, that same faucet cry that I talk about when I had that first Reiki session, the on the off, because there was no that convulsing jerking, it was this really strange release. And all the hate was gone. It's like, I no longer hate him. And when I'm sitting there with my team having this moment, uh, and then my ego comes in and they're like, wasn't that easy? And in that moment, it was like everything that I've heard from therapist after therapist after therapist, motivational speakers, healers, that I have to let go of this hate. In that moment, I knew what that felt like and how good it felt. And like this, this relief of this big, huge boulder that I really have been carrying around with me, dragging behind me, I was free. And for everyone out there that's carrying around hate, it doesn't matter what it is for you. You could hate um, the Cabbage Patch doll that you had when you were three, for whatever reason. Um, Everyone's going to have to find that way on how to let that go. But I would say that is probably the most beneficial, rewarding, fulfilling, healing thing you can do for yourself is to find that way of how to heal that hate. And for everyone, it's different from person to person, male to female, old, young. Um, it's like a slavery bondage release is what I can say. So that was probably the biggest uh, experience for me during the healing work that I have ever endured. Wow, that's super powerful. And I wanna thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. At what point did you know that it was time to change your path and to go full force in your calling? It would be that uh, Reiki session that I had. Uh, you know, it, it uh, and hearing that voice, which in the beginning of the energy work is kind of spooky. And in the traditional sense of psychology, if you run around and tell people this stuff, like I'm hearing voices in my head, then there'll be like, you need to get yourself checked in, <laughs> right? So it's not something you go running around telling, oh, I heard this voice and it told me to do this. You wanna be selective, right? And who you talk to. And so that's why we have circles. Um, the ones that I do, the ones that you do, uh, you're doing fantastic work so people can come to you and, and talk freely about it and feel comfortable. But that was the biggest moment uh, is hearing that voice and saying that you need to do this. And then it was like, almost like somebody gave me permission. And uh, I was full blast. I mean, I couldn't get enough of the energy work in my body. Love that. What is one lie that you lived by um, in the past? Um, or maybe one line that you're kind of overcoming right now? Uh, it's, it's going to be the, if you hate somebody, then uh, you're paying them back. You know, uh, you're keeping them uh, paying this sentence over and over and over. And um, as you know, uh, one of the biggest homework assignments you had, the four agreements, right? Uh, he talks about um, the judge right? And how we are continually judging ourselves. Um, I mean, look at the news. The news is full of judgment, right? 
um, we are human beings, um, the biggest ones that judge and keep ourselves in judgment, whether it's towards others or to yourself. Uh, so I would say that that is the biggest event for me. I want to kind of go back to your story really quick because you said you kind of found that moment of freedom when that boulder kind of came out of your chest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had that moment of freedom. What did you do after that? With all of that, like that's an energy, that's an energy surge right there. You kind yes. Of, you know what happened after that moment? What clarity or what thing did you just kind of like? Huh. Well, first, yeah, first of all, I couldn't believe that it was that easy. <laughs> Okay, because it's like years and years and years of this hate that you're carrying around. Uh, and I, that was my first response was, oh, that's it? You know, like that's all I had to do? <laughs> uh, but then and again, um, that's my design that our bodies and minds and spirits hold on to this almost bondage, if you will, because we're still functioning in this human body, okay? And it can only take so much. And uh, if I had asked my body to, from childhood all the way till, you know, my 50s, okay, let's just release all this hate all in one bundle. Uh, I probably would have to be checked in somewhere because my human body wouldn't be able to handle all of that. So that was my first revelation was, oh, it's that easy, right? But it's really not, okay? I say that and in the same breath, I say it's not because we need to go through a process to let go of things in layers because it's so intense. It's been, it was on me since birth. Uh, and then the next thing I felt was, wow, I feel really good. Like, it was like this full, <laughs> body experience. And yes, I'm sitting on the beach in Hawaii. So of course I'm feeling good, but it was a different feel good. It was like somebody took a scrubber and was just carefully lovingly scrubbing out every part of my body of this hate and just removing it. You know, yes, that rock came up all at once, but I think those were the two biggest things that first of all, wow, that was easy. And, um, it wasn't painful, like how we perceive, okay? Yes, I was crying. That was part of the release. Um, you know, it, it was that acknowledgement from my father that he knows what he did was wrong. Um, he acknowledges that if he could take it away, he would. If he, he's acknowledged that he can't and that's something um, that he's had to live with. So I think to hear the acknowledgement was also very big. And for us as children, um, some of us are afraid to speak our truth to our parents. And um, so those are the things. It was easy and how good I felt. You know, I want to make a little quick note to that because I've been watching a lot of um, Yeah, Love Fix My Life. You know, I love watching these little shows of like people kind of overcoming. And she does a lot with family issues mm -hmm. and I see this common theme with these episodes and it's oftentimes the people that are suffering or just the third generation of like the original perpetrator you know who like kind of was this, the root of this stuff they don't say I'm hurt or this is how you have hurt me to the person that you know has done these things you know mm -hmm. So a lot of times, um, you know, it's like grandma, mom, and granddaughter through generations. And it's usually, you know, Yana will have like the granddaughter talk about her feelings, right? And a lot of times it'll match what the mother has gone through. And then the mother will match what the grandmother went through, but they're not talking about it. They're not saying like, this is how I'm feeling. And this is where did this all come from. It's never spoken. No, no so you're right. I think you just saying like, hey, dad, um, I'm really hurt and this is hurt. Like that in itself is huge. Cause I think a lot of people don't even get to the point where they can even say that they're mm -hmm. sad or say that they're hurt. So I just kind of wanted to make that a note as well. I don't know why, but I wanted you to say that. And I think the reason why is because in some cultures, um, so in my family dynamic, you know, um, it was like 
you don't dare speak to your elders in any way uncomplimentary because well first of all you're going to get a slap right we were all afraid of the slap um and in the asian you know households you know you definitely don't do that i mean it they'll find something handy and fly it at you right and it, it never really hurt okay but the intent the energy behind it the feelings behind it hurt and so I think um, in some cultures, you just don't, that's why you don't talk about it because it would be, uh, you know, a disgrace uh, in some cases. Um, and, you know, in the Asian households, we know that uh, disgrace is big. And um, also in the Asian households, the female is not regarded, highly regarded, right? So, but yes, you're right. It is generational. There is a definite theory about behaviors being transferred in the DNA. And as much as we love our families and we'd like to say that everybody in our family is wonderful, it's the reality is it's not. You know, there's there's a few of us in there that maybe we would say, I kind of wish Uncle Sam wasn't in our family line or whatever that is. But if the person is recognizing that, if they're already recognizing that then I would advise them to see a healer and or teacher that they're comfortable with because that recognition is already that signal that that person can make some change in their family line. Scientists are actually figuring that out right now that behaviors are transferred in the DNA. Good, bad, doesn't matter. They're all getting transferred. So uh, that would be another suggestion I would have for people. What would you tell a struggling light worker to remember as they are attempting to follow their path? Um, I would say to find that at least one person that is your person that you can call, you can text, um, that you can just talk shop with. And because that light worker that is struggling, we're all struggling with you. Okay, um, I think that is the biggest struggle for light workers is to live our light worker life and the life that we live in here, um, mixed among people that maybe believe, um, some that don't, um, some that, yeah, I really don't care and I don't judge, but just don't tell me about it because it's a little spooky and I get it. Right, I used the spooky word uh, earlier in my experiences. So I would say to a struggling light worker to get that person, okay? Find that person. Um, there's, there's so many gifted teachers out there, uh, healers. I mean, look at you. I mean, you, are, you have so many gifts to bring to the table. And I think finding that person to talk to um, is gonna be helpful to at least go, okay, well, I'm okay. And no, I'm not nuts. Uh, you know, this is this is okay. This is just another lifestyle. What we're doing is we're able to see and feel and recognize an alternative way of living, something that our ancestors did a long time ago when we first walked the earth. Um, look at animals, right? How do they know when the storm's coming? You know, before the obvious, right? They're feeling the energy. So we're the same way. It's just been taught out of us. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend. Love that. Um, if you could assign or if you could give a book um, or many books to people to recommend as a reading, why, what would it be and why? Uh, you know what I'm going to say, Brie? I'm going to say the four agreements and here's why. He states in the book four agreements which sound really simple. So for those people that have not read that book, um, I would say read it and keep it and print out the four agreements, put it in a place where you can see it every day, be impeccable with your word, don't take anything personally, don't make assumptions, and always do your best. And that is so helpful with life. Those seem to be very simple agreements. And yet even myself, me included, I will do something to not follow those four agreements and then find myself in a situation, not big because I do the energy work now and I, I have so many helpful tools at my disposal, uh, but life, it's life. It's, it's, 
what we live in. So um, I would say that would be the book to get for everyone. What is the best investment that you ever made? Whether that be with your time, your energy, or money. Um, so time, energy, and money. So time is energy and money is energy. Um, and energy, of course, is energy. So the best thing to do, um, I would say, would be to be quiet. And for some people, this is really hard, okay? So if this is something that's really hard for you, um, then don't put so much pressure on yourself. Like put a timer on for 30 seconds and just be quiet, just be still. Just sit in a room and be still, be quiet. Um, and then over time, you're gonna train yourself. So just as you trained yourself to be exposed to noise, okay? So I, I hear some people say to me, I can't go sleep, go to sleep without the TV on. And we all know that that's not a formula for success in peace, um, especially nowadays with, with all that news out there. Um, so what I do in the morning is I have coffee or tea with spirit. And so what that means is I don't have an agenda. Uh, yes, I have my protocols on how I call them in um, and I make my coffee and I'm still halfway asleep. I'm not a morning person and I'll sit there and I'll just be with them. And like I said, no agenda. I'm not asking any questions. I just sit there and go, let's just sit here and have coffee and just be in love with each other. And, and you know, it's, there's never a time that goes by that I don't get a message. But um, in that moment, it's like peace. It's this safe place that you get to be quiet and it's a you time. You are actually recharging your spiritual battery through this. And so for a lot of people, they put that stress on themselves. Like I've got to see something, you know, it was kind of like back in the day they had the 3D art and they would have it up at the mall and all these people would be hovering around it going, I see this and I see that and I see that. And I would walk up to the thing and go, I see nothing. And I'd be all stressed out after that. I'm like, I don't see anything. Something's wrong with me. You know, all this chatter. And so I think the more we practice that, I think the more beneficial it is. And you don't have to have any training. Um, just sit there and be quiet. Because again, I'm going to go back to the days where we first walked the earth. And it was quiet. We didn't have... Um, Nintendo's, we didn't have the news, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have cell phones. Okay, so it's really beneficial for our bodies because our bodies are still the same from when we first walked the earth. And we did things to promote health, even though we didn't have this high tech medical knowledge, we did things to keep ourselves healthy. And it's as simple as just being quiet, being still take five minutes, everybody's got five minutes. And I know I said for some of you that can't really sit or you think in your mind, you can't sit and then set that timer for 30 seconds or a minute and really see that progression and know that you can do it. You can be still for 30 seconds. I think that's beneficial. To quiet the mind and just, yeah, allow your soul and spirit just to kind of relax for a second. Mm -hmm. um, what'd you say your favorite thing to do then? is on your free time, like what's your favorite thing to kind of get you just, you know, peaceful and in the flow and feeling good and. You know, uh, given that I live in Kentucky, there is no beach anymore. So my first answer, if I was uh, still at home would be the beach. There was never a time, uh, free time that I wasn't on the beach. And I think the reason why I did that unknowingly now is because they're crystals right? And so even though I had this really turmoil life, um, that's why I was drawn to going to the beach. So my go-to hobby now that I don't have the beach is to play with crystals. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. It's like being on the beach. Um, and so that's why I love the business that I do, the crystal business. Um, I love on them all. They're all my kids. So when I, it's funny when I go to a show, I will say, come in and see my babies. And some people are like, what? Your babies? And they're actually looking for physical kids. And I'm like, oh no, my baby's right here. And I'm so happy and um, they're fun. And I want everybody to feel that. And then at first they kind of look at me with that. Yeah, should we go in there? Cause she seems a little off. She's saying these 
rocks are her kids. And, but then afterwards, you know, they get hip on it and they're in there and they start feeling it. And they're like, oh, I get it why she calls them her kids, you know? So that is my happy place is playing with crystals because I'm so passionate about it. I love them. Each one has so much to say. Um, sometimes they over chat. Um, and yes, sometimes there's some naughty kids out there that need some discipline, but um, for the most part, they are my love and uh, they're so fantastic. They're wonderful. And so that is my happy place is playing with crystals. Love that. If you could assign one I am affirmation to everyone on the planet, what would it be? I am safe and I am loved. Now, there's some people that walk around and say that and don't mean it. So you could, it's kind of like going back to the Brie, you're ugly or Brie, you're ugly, right? Um, you have to mean it. And um, you have to feel it. And so how do you do that? The simplest exercise I would say is to get into that space, that quiet space and draw a line, right? Imagine, come out of your body and imagine another version of you that has a pencil, a marker. It has to be something that you like, a, a magic wand whatever, whatever that's the easiest for you to identify with and see in your mind's eye and draw a line between your head where you, all that thinking goes on, all that chattering goes on and draw it down to your heart and make like a loop and then go back up to your mind and close the loop. And it's this cycle of mind heart and just just focus on that mind heart and just keep on saying I am loved and I'm safe I am loved and I'm safe and for some people that are really deep in some injuries they don't even know that that's a thing okay so they'll sit there going what are you talking about I am loved and I am safe that's ridiculous in psychology 50% of your way to healing is to be able to acknowledge what it is that you need healed. You're halfway there. And so this exercise allows you to understand that the mind can play tricks on you and the heart always tells the truth. And when I say that to people, when they come for the energy work, some people are like, what do you mean? No, my heart lied to me because I fell in love with this guy and he hurt me. Well, no. Your heart did tell you the truth because you were able to fall in love and you were able to get hurt, okay? That's all a natural part of life experiences. Yes, none of us wanna get hurt, but then it wouldn't make the falling in love part so important and so special if we didn't, okay? So the heart always tells the truth. The mind can play tricks on you. So we want the mind and the heart to be together in concert when we say that affirmation to ourselves about I am loved and I am safe. And in the beginning, it might take a little bit to really believe that. And maybe you need to stand in front of the mirror and say it because that's a really tough part. Um, when I started out, I couldn't say I love you in the mirror to myself. I would actually laugh after I said I because I didn't. But if you practice and practice and practice and practice, and for some of us, it takes a lot of practice. I mean, now I'm looking at myself in the mirror, brushing my teeth going, yeah, I got this little bag over here, but that's okay, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Whatever that looks like for us, you know, for women, you know, we always gotta have this glamor face cause that's what's out there. But it's like, no, which is why I'm on here today with no makeup. Cause yeah, it, it's good. My eyes are in the right place. I'm okay. And no, we wanna put on the makeup. We wanna look pretty, we wanna do all that. I, I do that. Uh, but at the end of the day, we want to look in that mirror. We want to have the heart and mind connection because that's so important. And we want to look and we want to say, I am loved, I am safe. I am loved and I am safe. When you can reach there, if we look at the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, security is at the base and that helps us become other things. When we are loved, and we are safe. And that is the affirmation that I would love for everyone to work on. If I could just spread the word and everybody would listen, 
I am loved and I am saved. Um, I would love for everyone in the world to have that mentality in their hearts. Betty, I want to thank you for spending some time with us today. Absolutely. Sharing your story and your wisdom with all of us. Everyone listening, if you'd like to connect with Patty, I'm going to leave her contact information in the info box. If you like this episode and would like to be notified on new episodes, or maybe help us expand so other people can hear this message, please make sure that you like and subscribe. Patty, again, thank you for visiting. Thank you. Listeners, thank you also. Until next time.